for release. We want to see more of God released in our lives. We want to see every man, every woman, and the youth and the children across the street all experience the next level of your reality. Give us that privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. Perhaps you'll remember the story about the lady who lived in the boondocks. She lived way out from civilization and the way she operated in her home was, was through the, the light that would come when she, when she lit her candles or whatever the oil-based vehicle was that she used to give her, give her some sight. The lantern, perhaps. But after a while, they got electricity to her home. They connected it to her house. But the electric company noticed something, and that was that there was hardly any movement in the meter connected to her house, showing the amount of electricity she was using. So they wanted to know whether there was a problem, and so one of the representatives went to her home. They knocked on the door, and she came to the door, and he said, excuse me, ma'am, I'm from the electric company, and I want to know, is everything all right? She said, yeah, everything is fine. Is your electricity working? Yeah, my electricity works fine. He says, well, I don't understand because your meter hardly moves. If you don't mind, tell me how you use your electricity. She says, well, it's simple. I turn my electricity on long enough for me to light the candles and the lantern. <laughs> I'm sure you would concur that she had power she was not fully using. She had power available that she was not fully taking advantage of. It wasn't a matter of possessing it. It was a matter of the utilization of the connection she already had. Many of us as Christians regularly ask God for more power. We ask God for more of his uh, energy for whatever life is throwing our way, circumstances, situations, sins, whatever it is that we need enablement for. We regularly ask for power. But today, what the Lord wants me to tell you based on what he's told us in his word is that power is not your problem. Power is not your problem because if you're a Christian, you've already been hooked up to the company. So whatever lack of power you and I may be experiencing, it has to do with release, not its presence. Paul has spent the first 14 verses talking about all that God has done for us in Ephesians chapter 1. He talks about the lavish grace that God has given us. Grace you can't earn, you can't buy. It's a gift. And it is lavished, he says, on us. He concludes verse 13 and 14 talking about the power plant that has been placed in every believer, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is Jesus in you. The Holy Spirit is the presence of Christ that operates to bring the life of Christ into the experience of the Christian. And so having done that, he wants to lead them into understanding the power that they already possess. Have you ever seen a dog chasing its tail? It's going around and around and around and around in circles trying to grab something it already has. 
but because it doesn't fully understand it possesses what it's circling for, it never can find it, it never makes any progress because it's going around and around and around and around with something it already possesses. What I'd like to suggest to you and what Paul is going to explain in a moment is that the power you're looking for, you already have. So stop chasing for it. You don't have to chase for power. You have to release it. He comes and he starts off with giving the prerequisites. In other words, if you want to release this power that, guess what, you already possess, if you want to see it activated in your experience, he says you've got to set yourself up for that. He says in verse 15, for this reason too, having heard of the faith of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for the saints, I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. He starts off by praying for the church at Ephesus, and he says, I'm talking about y'all all the time. And he gives three reasons why he's bragging on these saints. He says, first of all, your testimony has gone public. He says, we've all heard about y'all. If you are a secret agent Christian, don't expect God to release his power. If nobody knows you're a Christian but you, don't expect God to release his power. If you were convicted of being a follower of Christ and found innocent of all charges, don't expect God to release his power. If you are a secret agent Christian, don't expect God to release his power. He says, the thing we know about you is we have heard about it. In other words, your witness has gone public. It is absolutely inextricably clear that you are visible, verbal followers of Jesus Christ. You're not Christians in name only. It has become public knowledge that you are followers of Christ. He goes on and says, we've heard about your faith in Christ. We've heard that you act like God is telling the truth. We heard that you act like it is so even when it's not so in order that it might be so simply because God said so. We have heard about your confidence in Christ that allows you to function differently than the world around you and your witness has gone public. He says, we've also heard about your love of the brethren. We've heard that you are connected to the family of God and th that you got to love Jones for the family. We've heard that you care about people, you serve people, you help people, you support people. You are, you're not just this vertical Christian only wanting heaven to serve you, but as heaven serves you, you're concerned about serving others and we have heard about you. It has gone public and therefore we are praying for you and we are giving thanks. We are thanks that you are the real deal. We are giving thanks that you're not play Christians and part-time saints. We're giving thanks that you are all in on this Christian thing. We give thanks for you. So he's excited about these believers and he wants them to have more of an experience with God given the prerequisites that they have met. So this leads him to go deeper. And when he goes deeper, he says in verse 17, and the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. In other words, we want God to give you a greater experience of him. Wisdom, knowledge, and revelation. We want God to burst through you at a higher level. We want you to experience more of God. I don't just want you to know about him. I want you to experience more of him. So he says, I pray again in verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, the riches of his glory, of the inheritance he has in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power. He says, I want you 
to have your eyes open. I want you to be enlightened to the stuff you already have. He's not praying that they get it. He's praying that they see it. He says, open their eyes, remove the cataracts, get rid of the glaucoma. He says, the problem is you don't see all that you have. And because you don't see, you don't have the enlightenment, you don't have the understanding, you don't have the knowledge of what you already possess. He's getting ready to tell them the power you're looking for, you already have, you just don't see it. So he prays that they open their eyes. It reminds me of 2 Kings chapter 6 when Elisha is being attacked and they want to destroy him. Elisha's servant says, Master, they're coming against us. They're going to kill us, and we have no way out. And Elijah looks up to heaven and says, Lord, open his eyes. And when the scales were removed from his eyes, there were a torrent myriads of angels that were circling the house with swords of fire telling the enemy, not up in here today, you not. The problem was that the servant couldn't see it. Elijah could see it. And because the servant couldn't see it, he didn't know the power that was available to him for the problem he was now facing. So your prayer and my prayer is not give me more power, is give me more sight. Because if I have sight, I will be able to be enlightened to be able to see what's available to me for the circumstances that I happen to be in. He says, when you give them enlightenment, they will see the hope of his calling. Now, most of us looking for our calling. <laughs> Paul said, no, you need to see his calling. Because if you see his calling, you'll know your calling because he will have revealed to you what he has in mind for you so you'll know which way to go because you're not seeing what you're looking for. You've seen what he's already seen that now you can pick up the signal on and move forward with the next phase of plan that he has for your life. He says, you've got to see his inheritance, what he has already done. Again, Grace is what God does for you independently of you. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. All you can do is release it. It's released by faith. He says, I want you to open up their eyes so that they can see what has been provided before them. When you operate, stay with us here, in spiritual myopic life and not be able to see things clearly you can have, I was I was I was walking around my house I was looking for my keys anybody always look for your keys you don't know where you put your keys down from you know I get worried about Alzheimer's when I'm looking for my keys I, I, you know I'm looking for my I, I can't find my keys I'm looking for my keys for almost one hour, because I can't go nowhere if I can't find my keys. So I'm looking for my keys. I'm looking for obvious places. I'm looking for non-obvious places. I'm going underneath couches. I'm going underneath the bed. I'm looking for keys. I'm desperate. I'm desperate. I need my keys. I want my keys. And, I, and, and so I, I threw up a prayer. I threw up a prayer. Now, 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 praying for keys is not normal prayers, okay? But when you get bad enough, even keys become important to you. So I throw up a prayer. I'm looking for my keys. I say, Lord, you know I got to get out of here. You know I got to get to wherever it was I was going. And uh, God, I desperately need my keys. So I'm getting up off the floor, having looked for my keys, slam my hand, and I hit the keys in my pocket. The keys have been in my pocket for one whole hour. I'm looking for something I already have. And then the other day, the other day, I get a book from American Airlines. I get a book from American Airlines, and American Airlines sends me this book, and, uh, and I always throw it away when I don't pay attention to it when I, when I get them. But I decided that, I, well, let me just thumb through, this, thumb through this airline book. You know, now, 
Now, most airline food is not that pleasant. It's not that exciting. But I'm reading this book and I discover I can order a separate meal in advance of the flight for something different than the flight is offering that would be much tastier than what they're offering me because of my status with them. I've been eating bad food when I got a book telling me of the inheritance that I have as a flyer with American Airlines. But because I didn't pay attention to what it was offering me, I had to be satisfied with what showed up. Many of us are satisfied with things as they are because our eyes haven't been open to things as they can be. He says, I pray that your eyes will be open, that your sight line will be expanded so that you will be able to see, he says, what God has planted in you already. So let's get this straight. You don't need power. You need release of power that you already possess if you have God, the Holy Spirit, already operating within you. So he says, I want you to know, verse 19, what is the surpassing greatness of his power? Not your power, his power. Not only is it power, it's great power, and it's surpassing great power. So it's power that's great that surpasses. Well, what kind of power is this? in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. So this is power that he pulls off in you. He goes deeper, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. He says the power that God has deposited in the believer is the power that raised up Christ from the dead. I don't know if you just heard that. The power that's been surpassingly great power is so powerful that it overrode the grave. And Jesus Christ on Sunday overrode the problem on Friday. Friday was a problem because Jesus Christ was killed on Friday. Death is a final decision as far as our humanity is concerned. When death happens, the party's over. When death happens, there is no solution. When death happens, finality has made its mark. But early on Sunday morning, just a little while before day, God raised Jesus Christ up from the dead, which means he overrode a final decision by our greatest enemy, which is death. He says, I want your eyes to be open that the surpassing greatness of the power of God, his power available to believers is override power because Jesus was raised from the dead, which means his resurrection overrode death. So whatever is killing you right now, whatever looks like you can't win right now, Whatever is keeping you in defeat right now, whatever has got you buried six feet under in your sin or circumstances right now, what God told me to tell you is that you have the surpassing greatness of his power that does resurrection kind of stuff. It does stuff that goes beyond how deep in the grave you find yourself in. This is why as a follower of Christ, you don't throw in the towel because he's good at resurrections. And that is raising things up from a dead situation. Things that look unovercomable. Things that look like you'll be defeated forever. Things that look like that you're entombed with no way out. 
things that put you in a Lazarus kind of situation and you need the stone to roll away to call it up out the grave. So don't you quit, don't you give up, don't you throw in the towel because he is releasing resurrection power. That, that, that's why your story is not over when there's a resurrection. It may look like it because there's a burial. But since he is the God of resurrections, then that story is not over. So he says the power, his power, that's been placed in believers that you already have is a power that does resurrections. Okay. Well, we need to know, okay, how can I get there? Anybody need that resurrection power? Okay. He says, which he brought about, he raised him, verse 20, from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Okay. He's getting into deep theology. So first of all, we know we got a death because we got a resurrection. Okay, so he raised Christ from the dead, but he's talking to believers having their eyes open. So he's talking to us, but he's using Christ to talk to us about the surpassing greatness of God's power. He says that I want your eyes open. There's a death. There's a resurrection. But then he says there's more. He, there is an ascension. Because he says he was seated on the right hand of the Father. So Jesus died on Friday. He arose on Sunday. 40 days later, he stepped on a cloud and ascended up into heaven where he is now seated on the right hand of God. When Paul, when the, excuse me, the author of Hebrews talks about this Jesus Christ and where he is seated, the author of Hebrews puts it this way in Hebrews chapter 1. He says in verse 1, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So Jesus Christ, when he rose from the dead, went and sat down next to God, and according to verse 20 of Ephesians 1, in heavenly places. What does he mean, heavenly places? Heavenly places, a synonym, is spiritual realm. Heavenly places means the spiritual realm. He says, Jesus Christ is now situated on the right hand of God. He is seated in the spiritual realm. Now, why do you need to know that if you need power? Because you need to know where the plant is located. He says, in the spiritual realm, heavenly places, you have the Holy Spirit, so that's connection to the spiritual realm. He says, God's power, the word of his power, emanates from where he is sitting. He is sitting on the right hand of the Father with the word of power, Hebrews 1.3 says. So the power that comes from his word is where he is seated. He is seated on the right hand of the Father, and because he's seated there, power emanates from there. And the there where he is seated is called heavenly places, which is the spiritual realm. So if you want to experience his power, it's got to come from his realm, which means if you are an earthly-minded Christian, you will not experience heavenly places power because the power does not come from earth. The power comes from heavenly places or the spiritual realm. That's why it is in the interest of the enemy to keep you changing frequencies. He wants you to be FM on Sunday and AM on Monday. 
He wants you flipping and floating so that you're not living from heavenly places. You're living from earthly places, but that's not why he's seated. He is seated on earth, seated in heaven, even though he's seated for the benefit of earth. Now, I know what you may be thinking. I need that power up up from up there, but I'm living down here. I'm down here. He's way up there. He's in never, never land. He's in that spiritual place next to the Father, and all that sounds good, but I'm living down here in earthly places. Oh, you think so? Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 6. This is what he says. He says, but God being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So guess where you are located? You may not have known you're located there because the enemy doesn't want you to know you're located there. Because if you ever discover you're located there, your eyes will be open to what you really have access to. He says, we died with him, we were raised with him, we are seated with him in the same place he is located, heavenly places. Now I know what you're saying. You're saying, wait a minute, I'm here in church. I'm here on the earth. I'm here physically. What do you mean I'm situated in heavenly places? Have you ever used Zoom? Have you ever used Zoom? You know what that means? That means you can be situated in Dallas, but talking to somebody in Chicago. It means you can be situated in Dallas and talking to somebody in a whole nother country. While you are physically in one location, you are relationally in another location because you are operating in two locations at one time. Because technology has given you the ability to transcend your physical location. The Holy Spirit has given you the technology to transcend your physical location so that while you are on earth, you are seated with him in heavenly places. God wants you to open up your eyes so that you can take access to the power that is available to you drawn from Jesus' seat and you are seated right next to him, spiritually speaking. And so he comes and he says, I want you to understand that this power is available to you and this power that raised up Jesus. How powerful is this power? Verse 21, far above all rule, all authority, all power and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in the age to come. Did you catch that? Not only in the age to come, eternity, heaven, but he says in this age. Your your age right now, the, the life you're living right now, the problems you're facing right now, the needs you have right now, the weaknesses you're experiencing right now, the defeats you're undergoing right now. He says, in this age. So it's, it's, it's in the sweet by and by, but it's good for the nasty here and now. He says that this power is good for this age. But how much can I expect? It says, far above all rules all authority, and every name that has been named. So whatever your problem is, give it a name. Because he says Jesus is above every name that is named. In fact, whatever your burial is, call it Goliath, because at least you know what's going to happen to it. He says Jesus is over every name. So you name your addiction. You name your problem, you name your burial, you name your circumstance, and then you sit right next to Jesus and say, Jesus, what are we going to do about this? How are you and I going to handle this? Because I'm up here in heaven with you, but I need it transferred by your spirit to earth for me because I need to be delivered. I need divine interaction and involvement because I need power and you are far above. You're not just a little bit above. You are higher than every name that is named. 
So every pain, every problem, every need, every circumstance, every failure, every sin, every addiction, Jesus Christ has an override button, a veto button to override it. But not because you go looking for new power, but because you access and release the heavenly power that's available to you because you've met the prerequisites and you're operating from a spiritual frame of reference. The moment you start operating from earth, you are now dependent on your power. Amen. You're dependent on your power because he's seated in heavenly places. That is in the spiritual realm. That's why the spiritual must always precede the circumstantial and the physical. You don't ignore how real they are. You just don't let them define you. He goes on a little bit further. And he, God, put all things in subjection under his, Jesus' feet. All things have now been made subject to Jesus Christ. Let me show you God's philosophy of history, by the way. You need to understand history. Ephesians 1.10. With a view to an administration, okay, so you look at the elections, it's going to see we, we, this election, which administration is going to be in the White House. So that's an administration. To the view of an administration suitable to the fullness of times, What's this administration? That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on the earth in him. God's philosophy is that everything, everything is going to be summed up under the authority of Jesus Christ. So the tighter your connection is with him. See, that's why you can't be ashamed to be associated with him. You know, you know, people, people now voting, you know, who's who going to be in the White House? Because whoever in the White House is kind of over the free world and all that and has access to all that. See, you, you, you want to vote for the right person when it comes to your life. And don't be ashamed to be associated with the one where the goal is that all things are summed up in Jesus Christ. Don't be too cute to be associated with Jesus Christ because you've now disconnected yourself from power because all things are going to be summed up by him. So he goes on in chapter 1, and he says these words. He says, then gave him as head over all things to the church. In other words, this power is not universally available. It's not available to everybody. It says, this power to rule and overrule has only been given to the church. See, that's why all this political stuff is all off. God's not going to skip the church house to fix the White House. See, it's, it's, all, it's all skewed up. God, see, you have to understand. God only has committed himself to his people. See? So what his people do determines what he does. And what his people don't do determines what he does not do. Individually, our connection with Christ will determine the amount of power from Christ we release into our life and into our circumstance. That's why if you're disconnected from Christ and association publicly with him, that's why he says, if you deny me, I'll deny you. If you acknowledge me, I'll acknowledge you. Your commitment to Christ, not belief in God. Everybody believes in God. It is your allegiance to Jesus Christ that will determine power descending from his throne where you're seated next to him down to your physical circumstances on earth. And you know how you know when God is real? Okay, and now we know God is real intellectually. We know God is real circum uh, 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 attitudinally. But you know when you know that you know God is real? When he overrules something you could not overrule. <laughs> See, when, when, when he resurrects. When he resurrects something that was dead, when he resurrects something that was hopeless and helpless, and he resurrects that thing, when your Lazarus comes out of the grave, you ain't gonna wonder about how real God is because you will have seen resurrection power in life's realities. So you must identify with him because he's head over all things, but he's only been given to the church. When Jesus died, it was Satan's goal to keep him dead. Because if he could keep him dead, he don't have to deal with him anymore. Satan wants to keep us defeated, so he don't have to deal with us anymore. He wants to keep us toe up from the floor up, 
so we don't have, they don't have to deal with us anymore. But once you get resurrected, now he got to deal with you again. Once you ascend above it, he's got to deal with the fact that you are now operating in victory and not operating in defeat. So if you're here today, don't you give up. Don't you throw in the towel. Why? Because you already have the power. You just got to make sure you got the connection to utilize the power that you already possess by virtue of your, of your connection. When you go home today, you're going to go home today to a house or an apartment that's got sufficient electricity for whatever you need to be plugged up. For your lights to come on, you've got electricity. For your appliances to work, you've got electricity. You don't have electricity because your house has electricity. You have electricity because your house is connected to a service provider that gives you electricity. You remove the service provider, you're in the dark, your appliances don't work because your house doesn't have electricity, your connection has electricity. If you ever stop paying your bill, then you'll find out your house does not have electricity. Your electricity is tied to your connection. But because of your connection, the lights are going to come on, the appliances are going to work, and you'll be able to operate in your house because you have a connection with a provider. And just in case what they have coming into your house, you have more needs than the, uh, the sockets in your house, you can go to Walmart, you can go to Home Depot, and you can get an electric strip which means you can plug it in to the power that you already have, but plug in more things to it that go beyond the sockets that are in your house. There is so much power in your provider that you can add to it and add other things to it because they've got exceedingly surpassing ability to handle your normal stuff and then to handle all that other stuff that you had to put in there due to that electric uh, uh, strip that you purchased. Well, some of us have got normal problems in our lives. Just everyday stuff that we just need God to take care of. We don't need anything special because the everyday stuff we can pretty much handle. But many of us, some of us, if not now, someday, will need an electric strip because we got so much stuff happening in our lives. We got so many problems, so many needs, so many circumstances. We need something that's got exceedingly abundant power to give us the ability to rise above all the issues that we've got to plug in. I'm here to tell you today, don't throw in the towel, don't give up, don't quit, because I know somebody that can raise the dead. And you don't have to find the power. He has already given you the power. You just have to release it by maintaining your connection. Let's stand to our feet. Would you bow your head right where you are? And if you are buried right now, tell God you need a resurrection on his terms, that you are appealing to him spiritually. And even if you don't need a resurrection right now because you're not at that level of pain or problem, I want you to tell God you want to be so close that when you do need it, it's going to be released because the relationship is so, so tight, so integral, so intimate. Acknowledge to him confession where you've fallen short. Acknowledge to him where you've created distance. Just take a moment to let him know that you want that, that seat next to him in heavenly places, in the spiritual realm. Somebody that you can help get them out the grave. Just like Lazarus, they said, loose him and let him go.